So when we stopped last time, we had watched a video about sickle cell disease, and I had written up on the board right before we um, left class, why is it painful? So the, the focus of the video was how painful sickle cell disease is and how it should be treated as a chronic pain syndrome. So I want you to be thinking about this question, why is it specifically painful, as I talk more about what causes sickle cell disease. Um, some facts, really basic facts about it. It's much more common in African Americans. And I'll talk about why in a few minutes. It's much more common in African Americans and Africans, should also say. So if you have African heritage, that's really what that should say. Um, and the reason for having your normal biconcave shaped blood cells become sometimes sickled like this, where they're sort of forming a football shape and not biconcave, is because hemoglobin protein, the gene that codes for it, has a mutation. So instead of making, where is our hemoglobin? Instead of making hemoglobin with this shape, it makes a different shape. And that has two consequences. First, if you have hemoglobin that is the wrong shape, um, it can't carry oxygen, and the blood cells change shape when you're in oxygen stress, when you've got low oxygen levels. These are some things that could cause you to have low oxygen levels. So you're exercising hard, or you're at high altitude. What's that have to do with anything? The air is thinner, oxygen molecules are more spread apart, there's actually lower oxygen concentration at high altitude, so in mountainous regions. Um, also, if you're, in, if you're under stress that in some way raises your respiratory rate, that, will cause, that can cause um, lower oxygen levels in your blood and it will cause um, greater sickle. Notice that people that have sickle cell, they don't have every single red blood cell sickled. It's not all of them, but it's some of them. And the proportion changes depending on these conditions. So these conditions could make this situation worse. So when the red blood cells are sickled, that itself causes two major problems, which I am getting to now. This shape doesn't carry oxygen as well. It's a surface area thing. So the hemoglobin is messed up and the shape is messed up. That means that this cell is not carrying oxygen as well as a normal configured biconcave red blood cell. And this does not squeeze through blood capillaries like this. This cannot squish down and fit through little capillaries as well. So these tend to get stuck. These two factors together lead to pain. So you're sensing low oxygen levels um, somewhat as pain. And the pressure of these getting stuck in capillaries also will cause pain. Does that make sense? That's why it hurts. It hurts, and then also you have oxygen deficit throughout your body. This is why this is why this is more prevalent in Africans. Who knows this already? Isn't it to do with malaria? It is. You're from Africa. Yes, I am. Yeah. Um, you probably would not have. You probably would not be prone to sickle cell no. disease because your ancestors Are were you? from Africa. Yeah. Yours would be. Okay, so the reason why it's prevalent in Africa is this, that sickled cells are less infected by malaria. So malaria is a, can be a deadly disease that you get from mosquitoes biting you and transmitting these parasites that destroy your red blood cells. This, awesome. <laughs> That type of red blood cell cannot be infected 
by malaria, this can. So that genetic difference that causes sickle cell anemia, it's actually protective against malaria. And that's why it is more common in people of African descent because it has protected them somewhat from dying from malaria. So are they, is it less effective or is it just not effective? Less. Less? Yeah, much less. Much less. I'd like to change slides. So we're going to somewhat change topics now um, from talking about how red blood cells carry oxygen to how red blood cells fall into blood groups. And so I'm going to do some of this material today during lecture, and then we'll do some of it in lab because we're blood typing in lab today and tomorrow. So it'll kind of be split up between both. Um, to understand blood typing requires knowing something about what an antigen is and what an antibody is. And I think on your slides pages or on your notes handout, there's just a space right here, like a big blank space. So I want to write some things about how I think of antigens and how I think of antibodies. Those of you that already had micro with me have heard this already, but you can help explain it to your friends later. So an antigen is just a small detectable molecular shape. It's a shape. If you look up the definitions of these in the book, this is not what it's going to say. But this is how I think it's helpful to start thinking about what an antigen is. An antibody is a molecule that generally has a Y shape to it of its own that detects or binds an antigen. These are involved in immunity. This is what they're looking for to bind. So it's Y-shaped. They're generally Y-shaped. I'll show a picture of one in a minute. So that's how to start thinking about what an antigen and an antibody uh, really are. And I have a, a movie without sound that's really short that's showing what is the concept of a molecular shape. What do they really look like? So I know that your book a lot of times will draw things like the Pac-Man and this shape that lines together with it, or you might draw something like this. Oh, they match, they bind. That's, that's too simplistic. So let's look at what molecular shapes, I don't know what is my deal with the screen today. Let's look at what molecular shapes actually look like. has no sound, so just watch with your eyes. So here's a receptor. It's sticking out of the surface of a cell. And this is what it binds to. And you notice they have a lot of nooks and crannies, and their shapes are a lot more complicated than a pie wedge or a sphere. They really match in surfaces and in sizes. It's a tight fit. A hormone binding to its receptor would have that same type of shape match. And this is showing just three ways of viewing that. That part's not important to me. This part, do you know where all this like little blobbiness comes from? It's the atoms joined by chemical bonds which I know that you, you covered that at some point. Like there's water. That's the shape of a water, or that's the ang bond angles and constituents of a water molecule. It's not great, but that's what, that's what the, the true molecular shape of water is. So this tells you kind of what's the relative size of this. This is a protein, a receptor. 
That's the actual shape it has from all of its chemical atoms and chemical bonds. That's what it binds to. And these have complicated 3D shapes. And they could also be antigens. So here, here are some other pictures of molecular shapes. What's that? Water. It looks just like that that I drew, right? Kind of. Um, this is a carbohydrate. Take my word for it. This is a carbohydrate molecular shape. Um, these two are kind of less complicated, right, than this. They don't really have that much of an interesting shape. This, this worked out really well. This is, in the red, this is EPO, erythropoietin hormone. It has a particular molecular shape. This is its receptor, and the receptor is um, symmetrical and in two pieces. It grabs it like that. And the shapes match better than my hand matches the marker. So this shape match is really important in what, what binds what in our bodies. So if something has a really complex shape, it's a good antigen. So if I says it has a detectable molecular shape, it needs to be a complex shape. Um, we don't have antibodies that recognize water because it's just... It's everywhere, it's not complicated, it's part of our bodies anyway. We don't really have receptors that recognize, or antibodies that recognize something like that, because it's not, it's not a complex shape. So, we can have antibodies that, that detect or bind to or recognize complicated shaped molecules like this. This is HPV virus. Viruses have some really beautiful shapes, which is ironic. But they might cause us a lot of misery, but they look pretty cool on their own. And this is big. This is really big. It's bigger than these molecules, very much bigger than water. It's big and complicated. Um, and this would make a good recognizable antigen. We could recognize little pieces of it. So some, some antigens, probably most antigens, our body makes these antibody detectors that can bind them based on shape match. Um, if you, a lot of times you'll see them in books, they're drawn kind of like this in a Y shape. This picture is more relevant to how they actually look. So they generally have this base part, and then they have these grabber arms, so to speak. And they will bind the antigen out on the ends of these arms. Whatever this side binds, this side will bind as well. Who's allergic to something? What are you allergic to? Pollen? Um, like paint. Paint? Brown paint? Huh? My husband's allergic to brown color. Oh, no. Just strange. Just wet paint, paint in general? Wet. If you're allergic to that thing, your body is making antibodies that hold that thing in the binding sites. For me, it's also pollen. So if I had an antibody that's specifically bound to pollen here, it would bind to that same shape over here, and it would be a pollen-specific antibody. You've probably got some paint molecule-specific antibodies that are causing you to be allergic. And we make all different kinds of these to help us detect what's not supposed to be in our bodies. So if we make antibodies to detect something that doesn't belong in us, it's supposed to be detecting foreign molecules. Something that's not part of us. So here's a question. Let me go try to go back. Okay, so here's here's EPO, erythropoietin hormone. Should we have antibodies against that? You say no, why not? That's correct. 
we should not have antibodies against EPO. Why not? It's not dangerous. It's not dangerous. Why else not? Uh, we need to create more blood cells and more blood cells. Yeah, we need we need this to create more red blood cells. Also, this should be a normal part of our body. <coughs> this is something that we're supposed to have. We should not have antibodies against it. Um, what about pollen? Should we have antibodies against pollen? I'd really like it if we didn't. You'd like it if we didn't. You say no, why? Uh, we talked about this in the micro <coughs> saying that pollen has no effect on uh, our, our body. It's mm -hmm. just our immune system is overreacting. Yeah, it's not really dangerous. We shouldn't really be like on guard against it. So it's kind of inappropriate if we have antibodies against pollen or paint. Um, what about malaria? We should, and we can if we've been exposed to it before. That's an immune system um, response. But that's a little bit more complicated than we need to get right now. So anything that is not supposed to be in our body that's, that's foreign and that is dangerous and that has a complex detectable shape, we probably are supposed to be able to make <coughs> antibodies against it, to bind it. Okay, so we know we know that antigens are shapes that are detectable. We know that antibodies bind them in a specific way. So adding on to that, if we're going to understand how blood typing works, there's two things that you need to assume in this. So you can assume that we can make antibodies against any molecular shape, any antigen, that's not normally part of us. If there's a little shape, an antigen that's part that's not really part of your body, you can assume that you would be able to make antibodies against it. That's assumption number one. Assumption number two. If you make antibodies against that shape and they bind together, it's a destructive process for the antigen. You can think binding equals destruction. So, if we were able to make antibodies against malaria antigen, and those two got together, the malaria antigen would end up being destroyed. It's a protective mechanism of our body. Questions so far? Okay, okay knowing that, what, what did you think kind of when you read um, blood typing stuff with antigens, surface molecules? Is that, is that thing, are those things that you learned about before or is it new? Sort of some new, some old. Oh, okay, forgot I had this. Okay, so this system the third thing to know, we are set up to find, by binding with antibodies, find and destroy foreign molecules that aren't part of us. This is the basis of graft rejection. Like if I try to give you a kidney and we're not a match and your body rejects it, it's because it knows that's not part of me, I'm going to destroy it for safety. That's how the immune system works. So knowing those things, that really relates to how blood groups or blood types operate. Um, every red blood cell has antigens on its surface. <coughs> so here's a blood cell, it's biconcave the normal shape, um, it'll have shapes on its surface. 
There would actually be a lot of different shapes sticking out, but there are certain ones um, that serve as antigens in our body. They stick out and they're covering the whole surface of the red blood cell. Your book usually shows two, but it's more like 20,000. 20,000 per blood cell. And those are detectable shapes. Um, the ones that matter for blood typing are three different kinds, basically. They're called A, B, and RH. Some books will call the RH antigen D. I think in the lab it's labeled RH. So A, B, and RH are the antigens, the little surface complex shapes that can be on blood cells. Those are the possible options. So depending on what your parents have, your blood cells will have some of those antigens on them. And they're, they're showing it by a, a flag shape which is simplified. We're using this flag shape for antigen A. Um, antigen B would have a completely different shape. I'll show, show that in a minute. So whatever antigens you've got on your blood cell, that gives you your blood type. That gives you your blood type. So you can have A. I'm going to go, go pretty fast through these. Um, you can have B, you can have A and B, you can have neither. Those are the combinations. Um, the RH part we'll talk about in lab. You can assume that whatever antigen you've got, you have antibodies in your plasma against the others. The others, not the one that you've got. The other ones. So if you have antigen A, your blood type A, and you would have B antibody. These don't look like Ys, do they? They're five Ys in a ring. That's why it looks like that. It's super antibody, five in a ring. If you've got antigen B on the surface of your blood cells, you've got antibody against A in your plasma. Why, don't, why wouldn't you have antibody against B? That's yourself. You'd attack your own self. You don't want that to happen. That's not survivable. So the antigen on the surface and the antibody in the plasma, that's what determines who can give you blood and who you can give blood to and whether or not you can have a fatal reaction. Does that seem okay so far? We're going to come back to that in lab and actually do blood typing. I tried it this morning. It's working well. <laughs> I'm going to have to do it three times. One to test, one for each lab. Okay, so the rest of this slide set, you need to bring um, whatever you take notes on to lab with you. That's where we're going to do this other, this other stuff. In lab, when we're actually doing blood typing. So, jump jump on to the second set of blood slides for PowerPoints. About the parts of blood that are not red blood cells. White blood cells and plasma. If there's ever a day when you don't have the your notes sheets that you normally write on, you can just write the blanks and then go back and fill them in later. That would be a good way, right? So don't freak out. But you, you don't want to just write the blanks and like that's your notes for this whole class. That won't work well. <laughs> you need more than that. Um, today there's a few places where I, you, don't, you don't have a blank because I realized later, oh, I need to add that in. And the first thing I wanted to add in is for you to know that white blood cells are also called leukocytes. So you should associate this leuco word with white blood cells. Also with leukemia. We'll talk about that in a minute. Leukocytes, or WBC, or white blood cells, all of them have something to do with 
immune responses. Which do you have more of, red blood cells or white blood cells? A lot more red. A lot more red. You see that on the microscope slides today. So one of the things that you, you need to know are what are the five kinds of white blood cells? What do they generally look like and what do they generally do? And there's probably a ton of little review videos out there for this kind of thing. But we're going to go through them now. And they have um, a picture below of what the outstanding example is. So when you're in lab, these are your pictures for the outstanding example of, can you find one of these on the slide? This one is a neutrophil. Neutrophil are the most numerous that goes together. Neutrophil. So most, most white blood cells are neutrophils. They're the biggest group within the white blood cells. And the way that you recognize them is that their nucleus is broken up into a lot of different lobes. So if we take a whole neutrophil and we slice through it, or we look through it in one plane of the microscope, it looks like it has multiple nuclei. They're actually all connected in a 3D way. But when you look through a plane, a slice, it looks like there's multiple. That's how you recognize them. Multiple lobed nuclei. Um, these are the first white blood cells to start attacking bacteria in your body. Um, that's why we need a lot of them. They're involved in first response to bacteria. And if you have a bacterial infection, you'll have a lot more of these than your average person. You ever known anybody to say, I've got um, elevated white blood cells. I mean, someday you probably will. Someday you probably will. It's not a good thing. They're, they're trying to fight something off if they've got elevated white blood cells. So if you see more neutrophils than usual, the person normally would have a bacterial infection. Okay, next, eosinophil. Um, this one, I remember it like... This is silly, maybe, but eosinophil, you, um, they're involved in fighting parasitic worms. Go ahead and put all that up. It seems that normally, in human history, we need these to fight parasitic worms. In the developed world, parasitic worms are not as common as they were throughout human history because we have clean water and sanitation and so on. So one theory of why we get allergies is that these don't have enough to do now, so to speak, and they are now attacking harmless things like pollen, paint, strawberry, peanut. What else is a ridiculous thing to be allergic to? Glitter. Glitter? I don't know if that's a true allergy, but... Because of the coating that's on it. Okay, the coating on the glitter. That makes more sense. <laughs> glitter is too big to be allergenic on its own. Um, but, ew, they're involved in worm infections, also allergies. These are so hard to find on the slide. T today and tomorrow, if you're in lab and you actually find one of these, you get a bonus point. I think I saw one on any slide as I was scanning through. Um, how would you recognize it? It's really big. It has red granules. Um, it has very little cytoplasm. That's what you'll look for. If you happen to see something like that on the slides, let me know. You get a bonus. Okay, next, basophils. I don't have any tip for remembering basophils. These are even harder to find than eosinophil. They're really it's not that they're rare, there just aren't many of them. That's the normal. Um, they have these granules. The granules are full of histamine. Like histamine that makes you inflamed and snotty. Wow. They release histamine during immune responses. They're hard to tell apart from an eosinophil. They're also big. They're also having very little cytoplasm but they have purple granules, not red. 
That's the way to tell them apart. If you think you see one of these in lab, let me know. This is also a bonus opportunity. Basophil bonus because it's so hard to find. Um, monocytes, whoops, let's go back. Monocytes are the second easiest to find on the slide. They're the third most numerous. Uh, monocytes are mega big, is how I remember it. They also develop into macrophages. Macro meaning big, phage meaning eat. All of that can help you remember. Monocyte turns into a macrophage, um, which eats foreign objects in your body. Like it engulfs it and digests it. These are pretty easy to spot on the microscope. They have this big lobed nucleus that looks like a bean. And they have a lot of cytoplasm, and they're really big. So these are the biggest. On, on the sides in lab, you want to look for the bean-shaped nucleus. That's how, that's how I recognize them. And they're not too hard to find. And then the last one are lymphocytes. Lymphocyte, as in lymph node, Maybe that's not too helpful, but lymphocytes, you would find these in your lymph nodes when you get sick because these are heavily involved in true immunity. Like if you're really having an immune response to something, um, they're involved in immunity. They develop into T cells and B cells, which we'll learn about later when we cover the immune system. How do you spot them? They're about the size of a red blood cell, so these are little. These are little, they're dark purple, and they don't have much cytoplasm. That's how you spot them. So in lab, lymphocytes, monocytes, and neutrophils are the ones I'll test on slides because they're pretty easy to spot. So that's what you'll be looking for. Um, when you are looking at slides in lab today or tomorrow, you'll notice in between the red blood cells and the white blood cells, there are little purple specks. Those are platelets. You'll see them, unless your eyes are really bad. Those are the platelets. And this side of this picture is the normal dispersion and the normal numbers of how many red blood cells do you have versus white blood cells. Um, this slide is showing somebody that has red blood cells and they have a lot more white blood cells. And it seems like that would be a good thing, but it's not. Completely not. What is this person's condition? They are sick. Good answer. <laughs> this is a particular named condition called leukemia. They are sick. Um, even a person that just has an infection, they won't have this level of white blood cells. This is really messed up. This is leukemia. And leukemia, there's that Luke prefix again. It's cancer of white blood cells and you're making too many. You've got too many. And it seems like that would make you super immune, but it doesn't. Because the ones that you're making um, are not really ready to do their job very well. And the ones that you're making, you're making at the expense of red blood cells. This person actually would also have anemia because they don't have enough red blood cells to carry oxygen because their bone marrow is going over time making white blood cells badly. That's leukemia. Um, practice on this. What kind of cell White blood cell is that really? That's a neutrophil. It's got multiple lobed nucleus. What about that one? 
That's monocyte. It's got the bean-shaped nucleus. It's big and it has a lot of cytoplasm. What's this one? It doesn't have much cytoplasm, so it kind of looks like lymphocyte, but it's big. This is probably a basophil where it used in the field, probably a basophil. Um, I don't see any lymphocytes on here, actually. Neutro neutrophil, 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 basophil, that's probably a monocyte. I don't see an obvious lymphocyte. Did you say the big one was a monocyte? Um, this one is definitely a monocyte. This one might be, but when, when I test on slides, I will find a bean-shaped nucleus for a monocyte. I try to make it real obvious. This could be a monocyte. This definitely is. This definitely is. I will be using the real clear-cut example. So from this section, white blood cells, you need to know the names, the general function, what do they look like? And there are five. Five of them. Okay, good. Okay. And then the other form element, remember when we talked about blood, we divided it into the liquid part is plasma. And then we had formed elements, which are cells or cell-like structures. We had red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. Remember, these can also be called erythrocytes. These can be called leukocytes. I think that these can be called thrombocytes, but no one really ever says that. It's platelets. Platelets. Um, platelets, it's cool how they form. They form from a big precursor white blood cell called a megakaryocyte. You don't have to write that down. But it breaks apart into little irregular shaped platelets. They don't have a nucleus. They're not actually true cells. They're too small. They're just little fragments but they become really important in getting your blood to clot. Really important for blood clots. And that's all we'll say about platelets until Wednesday. Wednesday, the only new material we're gonna do is blood clotting, because I don't wanna rush through that. So at the start of Wednesday, we do blood clotting. Um, end, of, end of today, we'll end with plasma. <coughs> So plasma is the liquid part of your blood. Um, it contains all the parts that aren't cells or platelets. And basically those smaller items that are dissolved in the plasma include the gases. What's this one? Nitrogen. Nitrogen gas. What's nitrogen gas important for for your body? Nothing. So why is it there? filler. <laughs> how, how does it get into our body if it doesn't do anything? In the air. It's in the air. It's most of the air we breathe. It dissolves in our blood. It doesn't do anything in there, but it is there. Oxygen and carbon dioxide are there for reasons. Nitrogen is just there. Um, also in the plasma are sugars, vitamins, amino acids, what else is in there that we've talked about a lot? Electrolytes. Electrolytes. I haven't talked about that a lot, but it's there. What else floats through the bloodstream all over the body? Hormones. Hormones. Hormones are there. You could add that in. Um, something else that's there that you've heard of, but maybe not with this word, lipoproteins. Lipo, lipid, protein, proteins. Um, lipoproteins, and you've heard of these as LDL and HDL, or maybe just cholesterol, in a general sense. 
when we have cholesterol in our blood, it's not floating around on its own, generally. It's in a blob together with triglycerides. This is a little bit fuzzy and hard to see. You've got cholesterol, triglycerides, an alternate form of cholesterol, and then proteins. And these are like globules of fats, lipids, and proteins. They're called lipoproteins. And they float through your bloodstream in this form. Um, you have high density form and low density form. What's the difference between these two major differences? One's bigger. What else? The bigger one has less protein and it is less dense. So ironically, the smaller one that has more protein, that's high density lipoprotein or HDL. People talk about HDL cholesterol. That's the good one. How can you have good and bad? Is that weird? That's the good form. And the reason it's considered good is that most of these particles um, get grabbed in the liver and disposed of. These don't. These are on their way out of the body, so to speak. So if you've got high levels of this, it's on its way out. It's unlikely to cause um, problems for you. If you've got high levels for this, this is not leaving your body. It's large and blobby and not dense. Thus, we say that this is bad cholesterol, low-density lipoprotein. Low-density lipoprotein. There's no difference in the cholesterol that's in those two forms. It's just, is it leaving or is it not? Where's the place in our body we need cholesterol? Or what are two reasons we need <coughs> cholesterol at all? You ever had this? You may not have. This is a good place to put it. What's cholesterol good for? Building gaps in the cell. Someone said it fills in gaps in the cell membranes, which is correct. I'm going to write that as it makes plasma membranes stable. You need it for plasma membranes in your body. It's absolutely essential for that. We don't want to, you know, remove all the cholesterol from people's bodies. It's not good. You need some. The other thing that it does that's really is important is it's a precursor or it's a building block for steroid hormones. You can't make testosterone if you don't have cholesterol to build it out of. So you do need it. Um, you do need it. And in some ways, your body is, is transporting cholesterol through the bloodstream for you to use it. This is the form that's intended for you to be using. This is the form that's intended for you to be getting rid of. The individual cholesterol molecules in here and here are not any different from each other. But we refer to... HDL is good cholesterol. We refer to LDL as bad cholesterol. Um, LDL is much more likely to get stuck onto an artery wall, um, especially if the person has atherosclerosis. You could write that here. This is atherosclerosis, or hardening of the arteries because they're filled up with plaque. Some of this plaque is probably composed of LDL. It's likely to attract more LDL once it's formed. So 
That's why we consider LDL to be bad cholesterol because it can contribute to atherosclerosis. What would what would this cause for the person that has this this problem? Uh, High blood pressure. Could have a stroke. Embolism. Could have an embolism. Good. Because this is narrow and it's also not as flexible. We'll come back to that when we cover blood vessel physiology. Oh, good. I'm get this in. Um, there is something else in plasma that's really important. Whoops, plasma proteins. Um, these are not really the same thing as dietary protein. They're particular proteins that your plasma is supposed to have in it for a particular purpose. Um, so they're, they're fairly big. They're supposed to float around in the plasma all the time. Some of them are involved in blood clotting that we'll talk about on Wednesday. But they also are really important for the osmotic pressure of your blood. Raise your hand if that freaks you out. Freaked me out when I was your age. Osmotic pressure? You heard of that? Where'd you hear of it? You remember? Osmotic pressure. Before I give an example of what osmotic pressure is, Albumin and globulin, these are the two of the major classes of plasma proteins. So if you hear that term in the future, albumin, globulin, those are plasma proteins. You should put that in your mind as plasma related. So these proteins are big. They're shown here um, in yellow, generally. So what we're looking at here, here's a blood vessel, like a capillary. The blue circles are water. Um, there would be red blood cells in here, which are not shown. And on either side of it, there's a watery fluid called interstitial fluid. This is tissue fluid. You could write that on there. Tissue fluid. And these are your blood vessels are surrounded by semi-permeable membrane. Water can cross through, but things like proteins cannot. And so the real reason why you need plasma proteins <coughs> is they help keep or they help hold water in the plasma. Do you ever do a diffusion experiment? <coughs> We're going to actually in lab this semester. You ever heard water follows salt? I know you do if you're a wrestler. You eat a lot of salt, you eat a lot of Fritos, you might watch TV, the next day you wake up puffy. It's worse if you're female. Because you have a lot of solutes in your blood, it takes them a while to leave, but they pull water toward them pull water across. So if you don't have enough protein in your blood, if you have low plasma protein, <coughs> you have less ability to pull water into your blood. What would that do to your blood pressure? Lower. Lower blood pressure. Um, that's not the only cause of low blood pressure, but it can be. What if you have a lot of salt in your blood? What does that do to your blood pressure? Yeah. Salt can work to pull water into your blood, too. But it's really supposed to be plasma <coughs> proteins that are doing most of the work for you. Um, I think this is the slide we'll end on. Those of you who have lab today, who are in Monday lab, um, we're going to have the syllabus quiz a little bit after we start. So if you need to go out in your car and get something to eat or take a slight break, um, we'll do the syllabus quiz not right at the start. 
and that will be true for most weeks. So. No, it's a long, long block of time. Are we staying in here for lab or go up? Go up. Yeah. Just in case.